Only half the night has passed, but pieces are moving and moving quickly. It's difficult for Jessica to keep up. But now the Nosferatu is ready to see her again, and the following leads on that thin blood killer have her intrigued. Let's go back and see D'Angelo and welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade. Coteries of New York, everybody. I apologize if I don't sound great, I'm still sick, but the show must go on. I also apologize about the recording mishap last time. I thought I had fixed the screen regions. I clearly was not correct. As you make your way up the stairs, you notice that D'Angelo's office is surprisingly quiet. You were half expecting something akin to a scene from The Exorcist, with Santa belching out curses and your companion sprinkling her with, well, whatever it is vampires use for holy water. What you witness instead as you open the door is a picture of serenity. The girl, although still curled up in the corner, is sitting calmly with her eyes fixed on the pages of some pulpy detective novel. She doesn't even register your presence. Sitting behind his desk, D'Angelo seems to be looking over some files, puffing on his usual brand of cigar. Seeing no trace of Larson, you assume he must have gone back to his family. Noticing your presence, the vampire detective leans back in his chair and gives you a tired look. Hey there, kid. Glad you can make it. Hmm. Any luck with Sansa? Santa? You managed to get something out of her yet? Same old, same old. Mumble, mumble, ominous, non sequitur, you know. But I do know one thing. She might not be all there. He pats himself on the forehead in an utterly unnecessary attempt to illustrate the point. But she's not all gone either. I think there's still hope for this girl. Anyway, I've been going over the case files, mulling over our options. Surprise, surprise! They all suck donkey dick. No matter how we go about this, someone's got his over. Her, Lawson, us. Well... Wait, did you say we have case files? We have those. Hey, say what you will about me, but I take my work seriously. And as my faithful assistant, you should too. So here's what we can do. One, we grab Santa and take her to an Elysium and make a case for her to Prince Panod. Two, we get Valerie to back off by feeding her the dirt I, I got on Lawson. Three, we try to get Santa out of the city. Come on, kid. I can hear them thoughts bouncing around your head over here, out within. Uh. It's a tough call. Even if we were to play the most inhumane game, trying to figure out what the right, the better power play of these three are is tough. Because I'm not sure I personally would do any of these. However, I feel like the information on Larson is so much more valuable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the first one, though. You want to bring Santa to Elysium. Isn't that pretty much a death sentence? Pretty much, but, you know, not quite. If we can get an audience with Panod, we might be able to convince her to spare Santa's life. The prison is as much of a hard ass as someone would like her to be. She'd probably rather avoid further alienating the Duskborn community. That said, if we run into Kadir, we're as good as fucked. See, that might be the play out of these three that I go for. Because, one, if we bring him to the prince and we get the audience, uh, we can then play to the favor of the Thin Blood Primogen. We did him a favor by clearing her name and doing what we had to do. <sighs> However, uh, it also could put a little dirt on the sheriff for not doing his job. Bypassing the sheriff would look bad on the sheriff, especially if Panhard sees things in our way. But we've got a few more questions. What kind of dirt do you have on Larson anyway? Must be some serious shit. Oh, it is. A few years back, the Second Inquisition led a coordinated assault on New York Kindred. Operation Lights Out. Very true. They called it. Nasty fucking business that shit was. A lot of good vamps died. Some of them I knew personally. Larson was one of the Inquisition's first targets, but when they got him, he managed to convince him to spare his life. In exchange, he fed a minfo and fellow Camarilla member. One, Nicky the Chop. Suffice to say, Nikki didn't make it through the night. 
All right, time's a wasting. What do you think we should do? Wait, you're letting me make the call. Look, kid, I've been at it all day, mulling it over, and all I got for my trouble was splitting headache. I just don't know anymore. All I'm asking for you is your honest opinion. Just pick one and make a case, convince me it's the right thing to do, or at least wrong. At least. So, one more thing. Bring the girl to Elysium, trade her life for Larson. Or sneak her out of town. Which one would you go with? Depends on how much I believe in the prophecies. The blood calls, etc, etc, that could be valuable. Especially later. Politically, though. Trading her life for Larson. I think it's, if I was to tra bring her to, bring the girl to Elysium, trade her life for Larson or sneak out, I think we're going to bring her to Elysium. Elysium. Bringing her to Elysium seems like the most reasonable thing to do. And the cruelest. Or at the very least, the most risky. If we can't convince Panard to give Santa a shot, the girl's as good as dead. Well, good thing I'm a Ventru, and we think we can do it all. Then we better be extra convincing. So be it. Fuck. Do me a favor, kid. Watch her for a few minutes, okay? I gotta make some arrangements make a few calls. He catches himself. Looks at you with an expression of the phoniest of phony guilts. But not, like, with a phone or anything, because, you know, that would make me a naughty boy, which I'm clearly not. He walks out of the office. Through the frosted windows, you see him instantly go for his clamshell phone. Screw it. Does it really make a difference at this point? You turn to the girl, who still has her nose in the book. What did I say early in the episodes? Find out what they like and lean into it. So, is that book any good? I don't usually go for this sort of stuff. It just leaves me cold. She looks up from the book. Her eyes glaze over. Cold. A shiver runs down your spine. You decide it's best to leave her to her reading and spend the next few minutes in complete silence. All right. Finally. D'Angelo staggers back into the room. What did she just do? I'm trying to rack my brain. All right. I called a friend of mine who works at the art hole. She says the prince is there right now in her private quarters. We'll just have to go figure out a way to get an audience. He walks over to Santa and crouches beside her. Speaking softly, he takes the book out of her hands and gently strokes her head. Hey, darling. I need you to listen very carefully. We're going to go on a little trip, okay? You need to stay quiet and stay close to me. Can you do that? Stay close to D'Angelo. She squints, trying her best to concentrate. D'Angelo? Close enough. Something akin to a creepy smile creeps onto her face. It's as close to happy as you've seen her. Gift, not hurt. D'Angelo returns her smile. You're welcome. He turns to you, putting his serious face back on. He nods. Looks like it's time to go. The art hole welcomes you with all its usual weirdness and grotesquities masquerading as contemporary art. Right now, however, art is the last thing on your mind. As the three of you make your way through the crowd of usual suspects, D'Angelo gestures towards a lone figure standing in the corner. To your surprise, it turns out to be Sophie. As you approach, she raises an eyebrow, taking an especially long look at Santa. And here I thought nothing in this world could surprise me anymore. Mind telling me what it is you're doing here? D'Angelo nods courteously. We're here to see Prince Panard. I don't suppose you could help us get an audience. I think you're confusing me with the Prince's Herald. An honest mistake in this lighting. All right. Well, we can look at what a harpy is. I was going to say, uh, harpy, I believe, is the other term. This is the term I use for my campaign. But uh, the domain Her Herald or Harpy knows everyone and all their secrets and will share them with others for the right price. Harpy is an originally negative epithet, but some wear it with pride. Knowing the role of information broker is valued at any court. This is true. However, the, the harpy in mine is like a, a caller, like as it is. But she's much more coy about the fact that she keeps all these secrets. In fact... The Coterie for my campaign invited the Harpy over to their first party. And of course, she arrived and took notes. They haven't interacted with her all that much. Uh, you know, she doesn't have to stick her nose there, but they are dangerous people, information brokers. Still, I'm afraid you're out of luck. From what I've heard, the Prince is not accepting visitors. 
Ooh. I'll owe you one as a boon. That's dangerous. She'd be grateful letting us in is also dangerous. Matter of life and death, no one cares. This is the only thing freaking vampires care about. And I think even, even as a businesswoman, she would know these first two might not do anything. Come on, help us out here. I'll owe you one. Her lips smile, but her eyes pierce you with an unflinching gaze. You already owe me, and much more than just one. Suddenly, you hear a voice from behind you. It's the last voice you could possibly want to hear right now. Maybe I can help. You look over to D'Angelo. He seems frozen in place, not able to move a single muscle. This is bad. Very bad. Keeping things casual, Kadir tipped an imaginary hat in your general direction. When he looks at Santa, you notice his expression sour, if ever so slightly. Perhaps this is a conversation best had in private. Follow me. Before leaving, he nods at Sophie. Langley. Kadir? Again, you glance over to D'Angelo, but he doesn't even acknowledge it. He seems to be in a state of deeply internalized panic. Not seeing any way to get out of the situation, you follow Kadir into a small backstage area. There, he stops and addresses you once more. It's good to see you, D'Angelo. It's been a while since you last showed your face around here. And I see you've brought friends. So how about we skip the unnecessary drama and you two leave without incident while I take care of our thin blood guest? She can be helped, though I don't know if he'll care. He is a Torrier door, though. And that's where I'm kind of thinking. It's not her fault she's insane. You've got to confuse someone. That's dumb. I think he, that's not going to work. You don't have to do this. She can still be helped. Maybe, maybe not. But that ship sailed long ago. It ends tonight with me. It doesn't have to be this way. Just let us talk to Panhard. That's Prince Panhard to you, D'Angelo. I know your harebrained scheme ain't gonna work. What exactly did you think was going to happen? You bring the Duskborn with a blood hunt on her head to my doorstep and what? Hope that the prince doesn't stay my... Or hope that the prince stays my cruel hand. Honestly, I thought you were smarter than that. But, uh... I promise to make it quick, painless. This is as much as you'll get, so don't push it. And with that, he turns to Santa. His expression grows softer, almost kind. He then grabs her by the hand, gently. There is not even an inkling of violence in his demeanor. Come, my child. You have been very brave. The pain is almost over. Pain. Over. With blissful ignorance, she looks at you and D'Angelo as the sheriff walks her out of the room. Your companion looks broken, as if, as if something inside him just snapped. Without even looking at you, he utters under his breath. I killed her. Give it a rest. If anything, it's we. Kid, I know you're trying to make me feel better, but it's not really working. I really thought I could save her. Not really knowing what to say, you raise your hand to pat him on the back. You stop yourself in mid-motion. Somehow, it doesn't seem like the thing to do. You leave the art gallery and head back to Red Hook. On your way, you keep thinking about Santa and whether now is the exact moment Kadir brings her final death. It's not a pleasant journey. Slowly, clumsily, you make your way back to the grain terminal. No words are spoken, no bad jokes made, no monologues muttered, and no smiles exchanged. There's only silence and vacant stares. I made a mistake, I guess. I was hoping we'd at least get a, a meeting with the prince and that's where our challenge would come, but it doesn't even seem like we get that chance. Uh, she's not, I guess, out of the ordinary in the Camarilla. Uh, however, it's still a bit of a bummer. Uh, beyond that, the only, I don't, I, I, it's weird because I think the game initially interpreted it as like a friendly thing where I was interpreting it as like a, a power play. I think the only one of those three that was a power play was maybe in feeding information on Larson and gaining, gaining it that way. Uh, getting her out of the city is, is too risky and who cares? She's a thin blood. Uh, you know, there's, there's not much value to her leaving and there's a humanity connection there that I don't really have as a Ventrue. As you head up the stairs to D'Angelo's office, you can feel the tension rising. You can tell the moldy sleuth has reached a breaking point. Oh no. He walks into his office and leans on his cluttered desk. 
You figure now is as good a time as any to break the silence. Are you going to be okay? The moment you finish your silence, D'Angelo leans in and sweeps all of his stuff off of his desk. Notepads, bits of paper, and what looks like a cheap imitation of an antique lamp. It all comes crashing onto the floor. It doesn't stop there, as he grabs a heavy file cabinet and knocks it over. Slowly but surely, the once quiet office turns into a heap of crumpled paper and broken furniture. The ta tantrum lasts for mere seconds, but as you stand there watching, it feels like forever. Finally, D'Angelo stops and looks up at the ceiling. It's hard to tell if he's had enough, or simply run out of stuff to throw around. As he stands there, slowly regaining composure, one of the objects scattered on the floor catches your eye. It's a small paperback novel, the same you saw Santa reading earlier tonight. It must have landed there while D'Angelo was giving the room a royal thrashing. You pick it up. The title on the cover spells in huge letters, The Longest Night in Other Stories. A smaller caption underneath reads, Another collection of stories in the Gianni D'Angelo saga. What in the actual fuck? You flip it over and immediately you're drawn to the picture on the back cover. If not for a, la a lack of flaky skin and distorted features, you'd say the guy looks very familiar. The next, the name next to the picture, Reginald Finch. You stand there, not even knowing where to start. Even in his current state, D'Angelo, or whatever his name is, remains one step ahead of you. Yeah, that's me in the picture. Reggie F Finch. Haven't seen him in a while. Wasn't planning to. I don't even know who you are anymore. I am what you see, kid. Say what you will, but I wear my heart amongst other things on my sleeve. I'm not Reggie Finch in a D'Angelo costume. I am D'Angelo. Reggie Finch. I left that guy by the wayside a long time ago. Honestly, it just sort of happened. Guess it was the only way I could make sense of it all. I mean, once you wake up looking like this, realizing your life and all that you were was gone forever, you can't really blame me for trying to take at least make it interesting. Look, whatever you choose to call yourself, you've proven time and time again that you can handle yourself out there. That you got heart, plus some brains and brawn. I guess what I'm saying is, the guy I've gotten to know these past few nights, be it Reggie or D'Angelo, is not just a character. He's a person, one I'm glad to call a friend. He looks at you in the eye. For some strange reason, you feel like you're seeing him for the very first time. Thanks, kid. He stops himself. When he speaks again, he sounds different, somehow. More confident, less exaggerated. Thank you. Tell you what. How about you take the rest of the night off? I need some time to get my in order. Starting with this office, some dumb asshole made one hell of a mess of it. You smile and nod. He nods back. I'll be seeing you. And so, you leave him to his thoughts. No way to be sure, but you have a feeling. He's gonna be alright. And an end night ends. I am going to stop here. My nose is driving me crazy. I'm still trying to not kill my voice and get over this illness. But we'll get back to full nights every episode soon. For now, I need to just take care of myself. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.